Good afternoon. It's Monday the 31st of October 2016, just after one o'clock. And welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Well, just to say, everybody who's uh, reporting into UK Column this morning is uh, talking, in fact, this afternoon, is uh, talking about beautiful weather and uh, sunshine being reported, warmth and glorious colours in those autumn leaves. That's certainly the case outside our uh, office here in Plymouth. So we'll leave it at that, I think. Um, well, we're going to start with Mark Carney. Uh, it looks like we can expect plenty more carnage because it doesn't look like he's going anywhere. Uh, he's on a five-year contract, expires in 2018, uh, but he's still expected to make some kind of statement uh, this week, possibly on Thursday, about his future. Uh, he said that the job, being Governor of the Bank of England, was an absolute privilege. Uh, like everyone, he has personal circumstances that he has to uh, manage, uh, but we've got to make sure we understand that uh, any speculation about his future has nothing to do with government policy and only about, uh, only about his own personal uh, position, his own personal life. Uh, although he says he's leaning strongly, or at least the, the coverage is that he's leaning strongly towards staying. The only person that sort of uh, out and out said that he is staying so far as Ambrose Evans Pritchard from the Telegraph. Uh, so maybe he's got some inside knowledge. I don't know, but uh, but it looks like um, we'll continue with some carnage for quite a few years. And meanwhile, he's playing in the Institute of Government, but there's no sort of political connections. That's right. But uh, we can relax because they'll soon be holding their uh, open forum uh, live streaming event. And uh, everybody will get the opportunity to ask all kinds of uh Questions which we'll get some very insightful answers to, no doubt. Excellent. I feel reassured by that so you should. on this Monday morning. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, over the weekend, CETA was signed. Um, so this is uh, in the middle there, the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Canada, Justin Trudeau. Uh, and of course, we've got the two European presidents uh, there beside him on either side. Uh, now, CETA um, is, a, is the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. Uh, it is a business deal, a free trade deal, uh, negotiated in secret between the EU and Canada between 2009 and 2014. I'm sure most people know this, but worthwhile just reminding ourselves. Uh, and uh, it's one of these uh, new generation of trade treaties, uh, along with TTIP, TPP, TISA, and so on. Uh, and, uh, well, let's see what uh, one European president at least said, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. He said today, the people of Canada and the European Union have opened a new chapter in the relationship. More than half a billion people on both sides of the Atlantic will enjoy new opportunities. Uh, we've signed two agreements that on, not only symbolize our commitment to a shared future, but also set a common project that will improve the lives of millions of Canadians. And do you believe him? Well, I normally take it that the opposite applies to what they say. So if he's saying it's going to improve people's lives, what he's actually going to do is help make them worse in some way well, or another. Indeed, and Jean-Claude Juncker, just another one of these uh, politicians that you assume is lying by default. Um, so anyway, CETA negotiations started, as I said, in 2009 uh, and uh, finished with a ceremony in September 2014 in uh, Ottawa. And uh, well, what happens next is that they have to, um, allegedly, uh, they have to take these back to the various governments and have the thing ratified. Um, whether that's possible or not, we remains to be seen. And of course, it does include the investor state dispute settlement mechanism, the ISDS, which is, I suppose, the main feature of these trade agreements that everybody uh, is uh, particularly concerned about. Uh, but I wonder what effect it's going to have on uh, Brexit. Well, of course, as we would, might predict, none at all, uh, because of course, this legislation will uh, go onto the EU statute books straight away. And in fact, they don't even have to wait for formal ratification from member states. It can go, uh, go on the uh, EU statute books in the interim. Uh, and, uh, of course, with the Great Repeal Bill, as we've got uh, David Davis here announcing uh, on screen at the moment, the Great Repeal Bill will put all EU legislation into uh, UK legislation as well. So this will sort of follow by default. So it repeals it all by, by bringing it into full enactment and rubber stamping it. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> yes. Uh, Let's not forget that, of course, CETA being signed that was delayed uh, because uh, of the uh, Walloons uh, in Belgium who were uh, protesting against it and refusing to, to agree to it. Um, well, in fact, they caved in uh, on Friday 
Um, so on the 28th, the Parliament of, uh, of Wallonia uh, agreed 58 4, 5 against uh, to permit CETA to go ahead. Uh, and uh, Paul Magnette here, who's the president of Wallonia, uh, said, uh, you know, well, I didn't agree with it before, but the amended and corrected CETA is more just than the old CETA. So within a few days, they managed to completely... He's been convinced. He's been convinced. They managed to completely amend and correct and create a whole new treaty, which everybody just agreed to, apparently. It's obviously nonsense. Uh, it offers more guarantees, he said, and that's what he will defend. Uh, so there you go. They caved in and uh, they agreed the deal was done yesterday. Uh, and we'll and see what probably happens Probably no next. pressure brought him on him at all, Mike. I would have thought that they had a, a very quiet gentleman's agreement. No pressure. Um, no, your career will be finished if you don't uh, change your mind fairly quickly. Uh, uh, Think I, again. I can't imagine that, that uh, Juncker or Tusk would do any such thing. No, no. Well, let's bring in another man who's been very keen on free trade, and that has to be, of course, Nigel Farage. And uh, I picked this uh, story up from the Scotsman. Um, I found it extremely interesting. I was initially going to caption it a non-story on Nigel Farage, but then I thought, well, let's follow it through a little bit. But here it is. Uh, the the uh, particular story in the Scotsman says the three front runners to succeed Nigel Farage as party leader, Paul Nuttall, Raheem Kassam and Suzanne Evans, have all said they will seek to secure him a seat on the red benches of the House of Lords if they win, according to the Sun Sunday Times. So there wasn't much substance to that. But we just say, what is this about? The, the man who walks away from his party, uh, he's in it, he's out of it, he's left it. And now they're saying, well, uh, actually, um, we're going to work to make sure uh, Nigel is there in the House of Lords. Well, it's all changing pretty quickly because uh, Mr. Kassam has now said he's going to step down. So that's another one gone. So it seems that nobody can actually get in a position of uh, power in UKIP while Nigel Farage is around. Uh, but let's remember that uh, Nigel Farage said he had to get out of the party because he'd been threatened. He was going to have to take a lower profile for his personal security and that of his family. And then within a matter of um, two weeks maximum, I think it was actually about a week, he suddenly pops up on the uh, Trump campaign. Um, so I don't know. I've still got people who get unhappy when I say if you follow through Nigel Farage, what has he done? He's led four million UKIP voters into a cul-de-sac. So just at the moment where all of that voting power should be applied to the government to get the truth out about a proper Brexit exit from the EU, uh, that's not happening at all. So um, I'm just, I don't know, I need a bit of help here. What is the story on Nigel Farage? But what we can say is this man is not commenting on any, any of the serious issues which are actually aff uh, affecting Britain at the moment. So I'm highly suspicious. Well, we mentioned uh, Trump, and uh, I'm going to come on to the main story in a minute. I was in London on Friday for the Free Alexander uh, Blackman Parade. This was the Royal Marine who's still in prison after killing an Afghan insurgent. Uh, terrible story. But while I was there, I bumped into this uh, very nice couple. They're on holiday from America. They were there in the sunshine with their, um, their baseball caps supporting Trump. And I had a little conversation with them, and they were pretty realistic. But what really came out of it was, how can the US elect Hillary Clinton? And I think they had, they had a point on that. Uh, we can think what we like about Mr. Trump. But what is the alternative? Uh, well, it's this. And an amazing story now breaking that they just happened to have found an, another 650,000 emails. And the emails were on the um, on the uh, uh, laptop of um, this lady, Huma uh, Aberdeen. It was on her husband's laptop. She doesn't know how those emails got there. She didn't hand over any of those laptops to the FBI earlier FBI investigation because she didn't think her husband had any, but apparently he did have a few. And um, this has now reopened all of the stuff around Hillary Clinton. Uh, and people are saying, well, this could be going on after she's been elected 
uh, president. So this is amazing stuff. We've we've got all sorts of things which have happened around this lady. We've got the Benghazi deaths. Uh, we've got weapon shipments. We've got murder. We've got uh, major security breaches with these emails, which were classified and should have gone on uh, protected U.S. servers. But she just pops them on a few uh, few local servers and shares them around. But no problem. This is the woman that apparently the Americans need to elect as president. Is there any wonder, Mike, that uh, President Putin looks at America at the moment and says this country is literally off its head and is therefore unbelievably dangerous? Well, it's clear that there's a major, a major fight going on within the American establishment over this. And uh, so um, some of the discussion, some of the rumors saying that the reason that this has been launched again was because the FBI was experiencing a mass resignation amongst senior agents because because the the, the uh, F FBI uh, investigation had been shut down. Now it's been reopened uh, because of that pressure, and now of course the pressure is coming on the head of the FBI, who's being accused of having broken the law by doing this at this time, um, and uh, so. That clearly the chaos, absolute chaos at the top of the U.S. establishment. Yeah. Um, so we watch uh, watch that with interest. But if anybody out there is getting a little bit concerned about uh, the state of uh, the world superpower running a mock or with Hillary Clinton in charge, I think I share those concerns. Um, well, good news, Brian, because uh, Britain has been re-elected. Uh, to the United Nations Human Rights Council. So Bastion of Human Rights, Britain, is uh, back on there for the uh, January 2017 to December 2019 term. Uh, and this is following 11 months of campaigning, uh, resulting in many votes from many countries around the world that Britain should be on there. Baroness uh, Annalee here uh, telling us uh, how delighted she is that the UK has been re-elected to serve for a further three-year term on the Human Rights Council. Uh, and uh, that shouldn't say Democracy Day there. That's a mistake. I do apologize. Uh, but she said that we will continue to voice, or to use our voice to help strengthen the council, to support countries working to improve their human rights record, and to hold to account nations that commit serious and systematic violations <laughs> against their citizens, as we did uh, leading a strong resolution, a special session of the Human Rights Council to, to address the deplorable situation in Aleppo. Uh, I'm sorry to be cackling in the background, Mike, but this is just hypocrisy on uh, steroids, isn't it? Well, from well, from UK. We'll come on to the UK hypocrisy in one second, but first of all, we'll just uh, mention that uh, Russia was kicked off the uh, European, uh, sorry, the UN uh, Human Rights Council, uh, and uh, Italy Cherkin here, uh, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, says uh, said we've been on the UNHRC for several years, and I'm sure next time we'll stand stand and get back in. Well, he wasn't really making a huge, uh, huge deal about it, about it but uh, nonetheless, uh, he did say it was a very close vote and very good countries competing. Uh, but nonetheless, Saudi Arabia sailed through uh, with 152 vote, votes. Uh, and uh, so they are going to uh, represent Asia on the UNHRC alongside China, Japan and Iraq for the next three years. Um, so, of course, uh, as Saudi Arabia is great upholder of human rights. It should come, come as no surprise that they've uh, killed a lot more people in uh, Western Yemen over the weekend. Dozens of people, according to this uh, New York Times article, including many prisoners. So they bombed a prison. Uh, killed after airstrikes by Saudi-led military coalition, struck a security facility in Western uh, Yemen. Of course, this was uh, a Houthi-controlled uh, facility. Uh, bombed and uh, many people killed. Uh, and uh, well, what did Saudi have to say about this? We targeted a command and control center for their military operations. Um, and we have to add to that, Mike, of course, it's uh, Britain at the moment that is boasting it is the uh, country which is helping them select the targets. Uh, absolutely. And uh, but it's OK, because we've been re-elected to the uh, Human Rights Council and we're going to uphold the human rights of all kinds of countries, except where uh, one of our colleagues on the Human Rights Council is breaching their human rights. OK, let's see what uh, John Kerry had to say, because, of course, the United States was re-elected to the uh, Human Rights Council as well. And he said, while important challenges remain, including ending the council's excessive and biased focus on Israel, 
So what he's doing there is he is diverting attention from Saudi by uh, appearing to attack Israel, which of course he isn't doing at all. Um, so uh, that was uh, his position on it. But it's okay because John Kerry was in Ireland over the weekend uh, and he's been in, uh, presented with an international peace award. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, he, was, he was in Ireland to, to hold talks about Northern Ireland, about Syria and about Brexit apparently. Uh, I'm not quite sure why he needs to speak to the Irish about Brexit, but anyway, okay. Uh, and uh, he has been awarded uh, with this peace award in Ireland, but it doesn't end there because he's coming, to, in fact, he's in the UK today. Uh, he's in London to uh, discuss the uh, Libyan situation apparently, but while he's here, he's getting not only the Chatham House Prize, um, but he's also um, getting uh, a medal from uh, the... Um, Long Service and Good Conduct Medal, maybe, Mike, no, alongside the Queen. No, no, no. Uh, and But I've, I've, I'm sorry, I do apologise. I've completely forgotten what the medal is. He's well, it's get. probably not, not relevant. No, or. but anyway, he's getting the Chatham House Prize in uh, with Mohammed Yavid Zarif, who is the uh, Iranian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, and this is because of the deal that they did over the um, Iranian uh, nuclear uh, deal uh, that's between the P5 plus one. So he's getting all kinds of uh, prizes in his uh, uh, twilight years of, of uh, being Secretary of State, uh, and he's in the UK at the moment to deal with Libya, apparently. I get a warm feeling from all of this because clearly as these people do their work to improve peace and prosperity in the world, the world is getting better day by day. day, by you, day. Can, you can see it, you can feel it. And on that subject, we better bring in uh, the illustrious Tony Blair. Um, we just really would like to remind people of the good work that this man is doing. Of course, what better place to take the information from uh, but his own uh, website. So the office of Tony Blair here. Uh, we need to uproot the poisonous growth of extremism. And uh, here he is at the 9-11 memor uh, memorial. And um, he's looking very pensive because, of course, this man didn't start any wars at all. Well, he did, uh, but he's not locked up. It's um, former Royal Marine Sergeant um, Alexander Blackman who's uh, locked up. Uh, but do have a look at Tony's website because um, it's truly extraordinary how an individual can just praise themselves. Narcissism uh, of, of huge proportions. Yeah. Um, but we, he, he says that we, we can get working in new frontiers. We can help make the world a better place. Look at what he's done in, um, well, where should we start? Libya. I, Iraq, maybe, or, Li or Libya, or et cetera. So we just wanted to bring his face on screen uh, to say that he's still free, multimillionaire, but he's helping bring peace to the world. Well, this gentleman... Uh, Sergeant Alexander Blackman uh, has been in prison for three years. Uh, he was put on the front line. He took um, just incredible stress with his Royal Marine colleagues. And uh, when he shoots an insurgent, uh, he's tried and sentenced, and he could be in prison for eight years. So Friday just gone was a very big parade, very well organized, very measured, very professional. Um, according to the Daily Mail, about 2,000 people attended. I could believe that. Uh, let's have a look at a little, uh, couple of video clips to show you the scale of this event up in London. So here we are, uh, Westminster Green. It was absolutely packed. More people behind the camera and to the side that we couldn't quite see. Uh, but these, these were all former Royal Marines and other members of the public who'd come to support the call to get Sergeant Alexander Blackman out of prison. I was able to go around and talk to some of these uh, gentlemen and ask them what they thought. We will uh, be having a listen to those, some of those clips tomorrow, uh, but they were pretty outspoken. And of course, many of these men very, very angry that their lives, Alexander Blackman's life, uh, put on the line by politicians such as uh, Tony Blair, David Cameron, Nick Clegg. And then, of course, when the chips are down, they make a mistake and they're simply put in prison. And at the moment, there's a very slow process. So although there is at the moment an attempt um, to get um, Sergeant Blackman out, 
the Criminal Case Review Commission is acting extremely slowly. And um, even though he has an extremely high profile loyal lawyer, Jonathan Goldberg, uh, there did not seem to be a lot of optimism that uh, Sergeant Blackman is going to be out of prison anytime soon. And it was an amazing atmosphere. And of course, you can see that Friday was also a wonderful day in London. But there was a great range of people. There was young and old um, from Royal Marine veterans, some of them disabled. You can see one of the gentlemen there in his wheelchair. Uh, but my goodness, um, some passion here from these people that are now starting to see, of course, that they've been utterly betrayed by their own uh, government. And um, this one, I just uh, took this picture because the speaker, in fact, dwarfed by the huge audience around them, Mike. And in the background, uh, uh, we have Parliament. What was going in, on inside Parliament? I have no idea, but I'll come on to that again in, in just a moment. Uh, this was really wonderful that the Gurkhas and their families had turned up in some strength. And uh, I was able to speak to some of the Gurkhas as well, but all of them really said the same thing, that to understand what it's like, you've got to be on the battlefield and uh, be shot at, see your colleagues blown up or ripped apart. And now what, what do we have? The fact that politicians who, of course, have just drunk beer in Westminster are now helping to make political prisoners of the men who have fought. And uh, I did promise I'd give a special mention to the bikers who turned up. Uh, most of these were also ex Royal Marines, but a fine display of leathers and some pretty impressive bikes, uh, Mike, including this huge trike in the foreground. Uh, and they uh, turned up to make a lot of noise and a big impact on the parade. But really, uh, we should remember this lady, Claire, Sergeant Blackman's wife, um, a really wonderful lady, attended the parade largely to say thank you to all the people who are supporting her husband and herself and her family. And uh, she sp spoke a few words to the crowd, but everybody I spoke to said this is a really fantastic lady who was, of course, stuck by her husband. And uh, what is she looking for? She's looking for proper recognition uh, from the government and a move to get uh, Al Blackman out of prison. So images go on. We'll just uh, show you these two ladies. Uh, this little poster perhaps said something let down by the government. I think this is a little bit polite, Mike, because I don't think Sergeant Blackman has been let down. I think he is a political prisoner. and. Uh, the legal team were turned on him in order to start undermining morale in the services. This is my personal view and uh, to cause further division in the wider community of UK, because, of course, it, it flaunts any divisions uh, between um, uh, Muslim Christian communities and the armed forces. So was there any help from Parliament? Uh, well, there was one MP. This is uh, Tory Richard Drax. He is the sole Westminster representative. Uh, he did mention that he had eight or nine colleagues who were also supporting Alexander Blackman. Uh, but when I spoke to him after he came down from the podium and said to him, um, where are your colleagues? Uh, he looked uh, a little bit sheepish and said, well, it's Friday and, and I, I'm sure they, they'll have wanted to get away early to be working in their constituencies. Mm -hmm. um, I suggested that was not the case. And uh, I also suggested that uh, members of the public were getting deeply concerned at the pitiful performance of MPs. And uh, the best thing I can say is he, he went rather coy and wobbly. But uh, to be fair, at least he was there. Uh, but where the other supporting MPs are, I have no idea and no sign of Plymouth's own Johnny Mercer, of course, the MP who likes to boast of his own military background, but uh, wasn't to be seen. Uh, was that a BBC cameraman there? Uh, didn't cite the BBC at all. And in fact, if you go online and Google this, uh, I'm calling it a parade deliberately because it was much it was much more professional and uh, 
quiet and more professional than we would say a demonstration. Uh, I didn't see any sign of BBC cameras and I haven't found any worthwhile, I haven't found any BBC reports on, on this on the internet at all. ITN were there, they did take film and uh, there were other small alternative media crews. Uh, but this was uh, something which caught my, oh, beg your pardon, this is something which caught my eye. Um, police presence. Uh, there was very little police presence. In fact, uh, there was about three police ladies, two, possibly three other policemen. This is one of the gentlemen. And um, I found this very intriguing because, of course, with all of those former Royal Marines in such a small space, the uh, parade must have formed one of the best terrorist targets London has seen in some years. And we would have thought that uh, the armed anti-terrorism police would have, would have been ringing the whole area, the so-called Wall of Steel. But of course, they weren't there at all. Where were the armed police? Well, they were still outside Parliament protecting the very MPs who have absolutely never been in the line of fire. So what do we think? A scam of the prevent strategy that they know full well nobody was going to attack these men or we've just got different standards. If you're an MP, you get the protection. Uh, if you're a former soldier or Royal Marine, you don't get any protection. What can we do? Well, one of the things is we need to carry on educating people about what's really going on. We say that there has been a complete breakdown in law and order and justice in UK. And the British Constitution Group conference on the uh, 19th of November is going to be all about the breakdown of law and order in this country, the attack on our constitution and the need to reassert the rule of law. And uh, one of our speakers will be our very own David Ellis from Strategic Defence Initiatives. David also attended the, uh, the rally in uh, London on Friday. Uh, but of course, he has been proved absolutely right on all of his main comments uh, that Brexit is a complete farce. And under the smokescreen of Brexit, what is happening is British armed forces are being pulled apart to help build the UN, uh, correction, the EU military, which will be backed by an EU treasury. So if you haven't bought your tickets for the 19th of November, get online and uh, you can purchase the reduced price £10 ticket. Right. Now, last week we mentioned uh, the latest uh, UN report on uh, poppy production in Afghanistan um, and uh, saying that production was up 10% uh, since 2015. Uh, and, you know, the, the number of acres under uh, cultivation also up. Uh, they were also saying that eradication was down 91% since 2015. So we're not getting rid of any of the uh, crops. Uh, and... Uh, but this was the statistic that uh, had grabbed my attention most, that the average yield was up 30% since 2015. Um, and of course, uh, what I was uh, particularly interested in was uh, how could this be possible unless there was some kind of uh, uh, technological support uh, coming from outside the country? Um, well, um, AFP in a number of outlets today publishing an article today, uh, multiple harvests are driving the Afghan poppy, uh, opium boom. Uh, and what they're saying is Afghanistan has all the trappings of a narco state with opium production, the lifeblood of Taliban insurgency from the traditional spring harvest alone, edging towards a record high. Uh, but then they go on to point out that uh, uh, they're not only having two harvests in some parts of the world, uh, but uh, some parts of the country rather, but three harvests. Um, and uh, they're quoting uh, a researcher at the Afghanistan Analyst Network uh, saying that some parts of Helmand plant twice a year because of the favourable climate, but three poppy seasons would be thanks to genetically modified seeds. Now they're saying, they're suggesting that these seeds may be coming from China, where of course uh, opium cultivation is, is for pharmaceutical use. Uh, and uh, well, in Britain, we're growing uh, opium for pharmaceutical use as well. Uh, our farmers are growing it. Uh, is it genetically modified? I don't know. Uh, but uh, certainly some external the seeds are coming from somewhere. They're not uh, being genetically modified in Afghanistan. Um, but uh, really, this is the attitude of the farmers. Uh, and this attitude has been encouraged uh, by the British uh, in particular and the Americans as well since we went in there. 
Uh, and the, uh, the quote in the article is that opium is money. Why should we waste time growing wheat? Yeah. Don't bother to feed yourself because you can make the money out of the opium and uh, Western powers are helping that process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, uh, interesting uh, article from, uh, this is Sudden uh, Deutsche uh, Zeitung. Uh, and this is uh, an interview, an hour long interview. And I suggest people go and watch this. It is in English, although the website's in German. Uh, and uh, it's a conversation with Edward Snowden. And they're talking about journalism uh, mainly. Uh, and uh, so Snowden is, has this to say saying journalists are increasingly a threatened class when we think about the right to privacy. Uh, and he's saying that uh, he can give tips. Yes, I can give you tips on how to protect your communications, uh, but you're going to be engaging in an arms race that you simply cannot win. Uh, and he also said it's because what we're doing is we're thwarting mass surveillance when we use encryption. We're not stopping targeted uh, surveillance. Um, so. Uh, he went on to say that uh, you know the United States or the West has technologies that can protect uh, communications in an unbreakable format when they're in transit. Uh, governments have reacted to this. He said, uh, as if we've thrown them in a pool of acid, saying, you know, uh, you're shutting us out. You're going dark. Well, this is false. He says any government official who claims uh, that every that the population is going dark is lying. We know this because we have classified documents from inside governments. And we have reportage from journalists who have been in private sessions with these officials. Uh, things are pretty bad for our side. For the government side, it's never been easier. Um, how we reconcile this uh, with this idea is that uh, these are theoretically, as far as understanding of mathematics goes, unbreakable communications. It's because what we're doing is we're thwarting mass encryption. Uh, so that we've just covered that. Uh, and he said, but unfortunately, journalists and the newspapers. Um, aren't putting on enough pressure. Uh, they're simply, uh, they're, they're just not putting on enough pressure. The, the, he believes that journalists should be saying, we are the most advanced societies in the world, we're the most connected societies in the world, uh, and in some sort of computer-based conflict, that the ordinary person, and journalists in particular, have the most to lose. So they should be shouting about this, there should be a public debate about it. And Snowden's comments are timely because, uh, as we pointed out last week, Levison Part 2 continues apace. Uh, we had the recognition of, the, of Impress, the dodgy regulator supported by the Press Regulation Panel, uh, and that's one strand towards invoking Section 40 of the Levison Report. Uh, and as we pointed out on Friday, uh, the other strand is the slightly introduced amendments to the Investigatory Powers Bill 2015-2016 and 2016-2017. It's going through Parliament at the moment, as you can see on screen at the moment, the third reading takes place today in the House of Lords. Uh, and uh, this little amendment put into uh, this investigatory powers bill, which of course is all about legalising the mass and targeted surveillance that the U UK uh, security services have been doing for the last number of years, retrospectively legalising it really, uh, even though that's not legal in itself. Um, so, but the, this amendment would legal or would put into legislation Section 40 of Levison. Uh, that is uh, a hugely dangerous step uh, towards full uh, regulation of the press by the state uh, and uh, making it practically impossible for uh, for newspapers and other media outlets to, to prove where they got a particular piece of information from. Yeah, it's, it's really dangerous times when, when you look at this because, of course, if the state can gain full control over any form of news reporting, then we are very, very close to a dictatorship indeed. And uh, the Leveson exposure, which the Daily Mail principally led with 10, I think it might have been 11 pages, but the Sun also um, uh, covered it, as did the Telegraph and the Guardian, it seemed that journalists were picking up on what was coming, um, but now it seems to be dribbling through. It's done a little bit at a time, the salami slicing, so that people don't really see what's coming in. Um, government wants to spy on your emails. Government wants to be able to close down articles it doesn't like. And of course, what's the main subject that the government wants to close down? It is the abuse of children. So if you're a politician, if you are a member of the establishment, if you're a wealthy uh, celebrity, 
then you're going to be able to say, well, I don't want anything reported. I've only been accused. Nobody needs to know my name. And of course, that means that other uh, victims will never be aware that uh, other individuals have accused somebody of, for example, child abuse. Uh, well, that's absolutely right. And of course, uh, what's really sneaky about this, um, we'll just bring the investigatory powers bill on screen again. This is such a huge piece of legislation. And so much coverage is going to be given to the main aspects of this, which is about privacy and, and encryption and all these kinds of issues that Snowden is talking about. And to put this little amendment in, which, in, in, which effectively uh, puts Section 40 into legislation, um, they're attempting to hide the fact that this is actually going into legislation. Yeah. And that, that's a pretty dangerous thing and, uh, and pretty sly piece of uh, uh, politics. And of course, that was all put in place um, under the lead of Theresa May, Home Secretary. And this very dangerous woman is now Prime Minister. So we, we need to uh, wake up pretty quickly. Well, we don't always agree with Simon Heffer, but um, this was sent through to us. Um, so he had an article which was principally about Tony Blair. Uh, but in the article was also this, uh, saying that HMS Illustrious uh, was going to go for scrap in Turkey. Uh, apparently, some businessmen have offered a million pounds over the scrap price if they can get it to turn it into a museum. That in itself is, we will say, an insult to the nation. However, um, the biggest insult is scrap. Um, let's remember the people who've uh, brought uh, our nation to this state of affairs. So David Cameron utterly lied over his defence policy, desperate to get rid of the Nimrod aircraft, desperate to get rid of the carriers. And we've just in the last few days had the fraud that the Russian fleet has come through the English Channel. Russia was going to attack us. Russia was going to murder us in our beds. So at the very time we might have thought if that was the case, we needed um, our best defence capability. Of course, the Conservative government is simply selling off major assets for scrap. And um, illustrious, albeit an old aircraft carrier, was still perfectly serviceable. And uh, we'll remind ourselves, of course, that the previous Ark Royal uh, fixed wing aircraft carrier uh, was sailing around for many years with large amounts of uh, concrete in the bottom in order to seal holes in the steel plate. So ships can be kept at sea under rather extraordinary circumstances for a very long period of time. As long as they can get those aircraft airborne, they're capable of doing their job. But David Cameron, Theresa May, at the very time they are shouting, we must be terrified of the Russians all uh, scrapping major assets. And as David Ellis has said, the reason for this is that Britain's military had to be cut to roughly the same sort of uh, strength as other European nations in order to make the integration into the EU military that much easier. Treason is the word for it. That's uh, the best we can do. Um, now, before we leave you today, um, somebody is pointing out that tomorrow evening at 7.30 in London, uh, there is a global warming conference. Uh, it's Mr. Corbyn's brother. I've forgotten his uh, Piers. Piers Corbyn, who's actually going to be there talking. This is the scam of global warming. Uh, what I haven't got in front of me, and apologies for that, is the actual venue, but I understand it's very close to Pimlico um, Station. So we will uh, find the venue and I will tweet that out immediately after the news today. Um, if you are as big a sceptic over climate change as we are and you're in the London area, you may well want to go along and hear what he's got to say. Clearly global warming at work in Plymouth today though, Mike. Must be. Indeed. That uh, completes UK Column News today. Some fairly extraordinary events worldwide and in UK. If you like what we're doing and the analysis we're providing, perhaps you consider taking out a subscription with UK Column, uh, which you can do via the website. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.